Facebook. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the Texas Children and Nature Network's exclusive partner webinar, What in the World? Engaging Kids in Outdoor Learning Connected to TEKS. My name is Alice Jansen and I'm the Education Events Coordinator with the Texas Children and Nature Network. And we are very excited to have you all with us this afternoon. We have Erin Shields with the Bosk Museum. Did I say it right? Bosky. Okay, Bosky. I knew I was going to say it wrong. I meant to ask you in advance with the Bosky <laughs> Museum in Waco. And she's helping us with our tech support today and taking attendance. So thank you very much for being here, Erin. Um, we do have automated closed captioning for this workshop. You can click the show caption CC button on the Zoom toolbar for the live transcript options. And we are recording our session today. So to save bandwidth, we ask everyone to turn off their cameras and mute themselves during the presentation, please. I will be monitoring the chat so you can share your questions there and I will share them with our presenters during the Q&A portion of the presentation as well. I will also share the recording link of today's session and a follow-up email that'll um, be sent out next week. If you are uncomfortable with your name showing, you can change your name to anonymous and then private message Aaron with your name for our attendance. Also, if your Zoom name doesn't match the name you're registered with, please change your name or private message Aaron with your name. This next part is very important, so please listen carefully. Only registrants that attend the live webinar are eligible to receive a certificate of completion. We do not automatically send all attendees a certificate. You must request the certificate after attending the live webinar. The email that you received with the webinar Zoom link has the specific instructions for requesting the certificate. Attendance is taken during the live webinar and we will check our attendance list to confirm your participation. We will need the name you registered with to issue the certificate. All right, now that we got that out of the way, I'm going to read our land acknowledgement. The Texas Children and Nature Network is headquartered in Austin, and as such, I am on the ancestral and unceded land of the Tonkwa, Comanche, and Sana people. Our ongoing colonial presence on indigenous lands compels us to take action now to counteract the effects of colonization. The work we do through the Texas Children and Nature Network is one small step towards that effort. And here in a bit, I will put some information in the chat to learn more about land acknowledgements and these indigenous peoples groups. So today we have a very special webinar planned for you all called What in the World? Engaging, I love that name by the way. What in the World? Engaging in Outdoor Learning Connected to Teaks with Kiki Corey with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and Liz Baker and Carla Bailey with the Texas Education Agency. So I wanna thank you all so much for being here and I'll go ahead and let you all get started. Thank you. I've forgotten who was going to start. <laughs> I hope it wasn't me. <laughs> yes. So, uh, well, okay. So, so uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Kiki Corey. I'm the Project Wild Coordinator at Texas Parks and Wildlife and the past president of the Science Teachers Association of Texas. Welcome, everybody. My name is Carla Bailey, and I am the Elementary Math and Science Content Specialist at Texas Education Agency. And I am Liz Baker, the Secondary Science Specialist at TEA. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Kiki. Okay, yeah. Let me make sure I say what I was intending to say. Um, okay, yeah, so um <laughs> to kind of introduce introduce this webinar and what in the world are we doing with this thing uh we all know that educators interpreters caregivers and anyone taking care of kids outdoors are teaching life lessons in awareness and appreciation we can also be teaching science in a way that's difficult indoors if we're aware of what's being taught in the classroom and the words the teachers use to describe those concepts and skills they're building, we can make connections between the classroom and the natural world. So this webinar is meant to give those of us with the rich outdoors experiences a taste of what's going on in the classroom from the teacher's side, from the TEA side. Okay, so the things that we are going to be looking at and doing today, um, we are going to define phenomena, 
Uh, we're going to talk about them in context of outdoor informal education. We are going to make connections between the recurring themes and concepts, uh, which are a, a specific set of uh, ideas that can be used to connect uh, the world around us. And uh, we're going to look at those in the context of outdoor and formal education. And uh, we're also going to directly connect the recurring themes and concepts of structure and function to the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. Okay, so when you think of the word phenomenon, what comes to mind? Uh, give you a little bit to think of a personal definition for the word. And then we're going to take a look at four images and you are going to type into the chat which of those images most resonates with your definition of phenomenon. Ready? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and type in the chat. <laughs> Alice, you are not wrong. Let me know when you're ready, Liz. Uh, we've got a few more people. Okay. The last couple of people uh, have uh, typed in my response. So let's go ahead. So phenomena, um, the definition that uh, we have developed at TEA is detectable events that are observed through the senses or technology can be explained through scientific laws, ideas, principles, and theories. So, out of those four images, can it be observed through the senses? And can it be explained through scientific laws, ideas, principles, or theories? And a number of you have said all of the above, and that is absolutely accurate. All of these are phenomena. So what we're going to look at, go ahead, Carla. What we're going to look at is where phenomena exist within the science standards and how teachers are using phenomena or will be using phenomena in the classroom and then how you can help support that. Uh, so uh, an example um, in fourth grade is these four standards. Students are asking questions. They're defining problems based on phenomena. They're developing and using models to represent phenomena. They're looking at patterns that help explain phenomena and they're looking at cause and effect relationships within phenomena. There are equivalents to those uh, student expectations uh, throughout grades K-12. So, Carla? Thank you. Take it away. So, like Liz said, the um, phenomena is what you all get to see all the time in your outdoor ed um, situations. 
And so we want to really connect you with the new science standards that are being implemented next year. Um, this is what all of our students K-12 are expected to do. We have um, some specific things that are K-8 um, that um, we want to show. So let's look at the recurring themes and concepts. So as, as we started off on this, we said we wanted to identify these themes and concepts that exhibit throughout all phenomena and systems and um, you know events that we might observe and looking at these ways that um, science is connected. Um, so I'm going to go through these in just a second. Here's an idea. So with patterns, patterns are regular sequences that we find throughout nature. Um, you're, I'm sure you're already thinking of different ones that you see in your own um, scenarios. Um, they're repeating shapes, behaviors, and events. Um, these have patterns that allow us to classify objects and phenomena. Another one of our recurring themes that we um, that students are learning in the classroom and can learn anywhere um, is cause and effect relationships. So our cause and effect relationships are any relationship between two or more variables um, or phenomena whereby one variable or event leads to a predictable response. Events have causes and sometimes they're simple and sometimes they're multifaceted or just have more than one cause um, or more than one effect. Scale, proportion, and quantity in systems is another one that you can find. You know, when we think about students looking at stars and um, maybe they're looking at pond systems, we have all kinds of different scales, proportions, quantities that um, are within these systems. And it's important to consider how changes in those scale, proportion, or quantities affect the system structure or performance. Um, scale meaning you know, referring to the size of an object in relation to another, we students often can see this with, well, we know that the sun is much larger than we actually visualize it to be. Um, and then proportion meaning uh, is the ratio of one quantity to another. And just um, even in kinder, they're already beginning with the word quantities. So um, some of these, these terms, as I say, uh, phenomena, these are terms that we hope our students are using even as early as kindergarten. So another recurring theme and concept we might see um, and that students are learning about are modeling the interdependence and parts of a system, knowing that a system is a whole made of parts um, and it's those components, um, it has components, it has boundaries and they interact um, to allow um, the system to function. Another one that we have our flow of energy and cycling of matter in systems. Um, and then this one, you know, we really are digging into even um, as early as kinder, first, second grade, we're starting, we start with some of these concepts. They may not be um, the terms flow of energy and cycling of matter, but they are developing some foundational skills. So matter and energy are conserved, um, changing forms, and, but maintaining quantities. Energy flows within a system or between systems through transfers and transformations and matter cycled through systems, um, through physical and chemical processes. I hope y'all are enjoying these pictures. These, these pictures crack me up, um, especially this one with this uh, dog. Um, so relationship between structure and function. Uh, structure is an organized arrangement of particles, parts or elements in a substance, body or entity. The function is the purpose for that item to exist in a system. And often we see that the function of a particular structure, in this case, you might see the dog's ears or the hummingbirds, um, the, it, we, we can see that um, that structure really allows that function to um, take hold. And last but definitely not least, we have stability and change. Um, stability describes a system that does not change at the observed scale. Um, and so it, it can be changing, but in our frame of reference, we don't see that change. Um, stability implies that a small disturbance will die out and the system will return to a stable state. Um, change in the system can come from modifying a factor or condition. So I'm hopeful before I go into the next uh, phase of this, I'm hopeful that maybe as I was saying some of these, you were starting to see, oh yeah, 
this is something that I would see as I'm, you know, out with children in nature or, um, you know, working with children around some of these uh, outdoor concepts. Um, you might be consider making those connections for yourself. So we're going to try to apply one of these to a, situ a situation. And we're going to use a practice that we call notice and wonder. So we're going to first notice, and I'm going to give you all some great time to, to take note of all the items in this picture, noticing anything you can. And I'm just going to give you just a little bit. Let's take a close look. Maybe you noticed a flower. Maybe you noticed the insect. Maybe you noticed the environment that exists around that. And with the flower, perhaps you notice that it's small and it's clustered together and it's white. I'm sure there's more things to notice. These are the ones that I could call out. Um, with our insect here, we, we know it can fly. Um, it's sitting on the flower, so that's something we could notice. Um, it has thin wings, the veins in the wings, it has veins in the wings and it has antenna. And we notice in the environment that it's daytime, it's not nighttime. So with a notice and wonder, we have to stop and just really take note. And so this is really such an easy practice to incorporate when you are out and about with children in nature you know, and, and it could just be even family members, um, but you are connecting to those concepts in the classroom by doing so. So then the next stage would be to wonder, what do we notice about these? What do we question about those things that we noticed? So with the flower, it was small. Well, we might ask, does the size matter to an insect? Um, the fact that it was clustered together does being clustered together provide more food or something to land on? The fact that it's white, does this insect like the color white? Um, those things about the insect that we noticed, well, we noticed it can fly. So does he visit many types of flowers? He's sitting on the flower. So is he resting or, or it is it resting or eating? Um, it has thin wings. So what would that be like if it were heavy. Um, we have veins in the wings. So why do they have veins in their wings? An antenna, why do the antenna, what do they do? And the environment, the daytime, does this insect maybe fly at nighttime? So just with a quick notice and taking a minute to think about all those things that we noticed, we ask lots of great questions. And we wanna now think about that through that lens of the relationship between structure and function. So looking at the way that those things are designed, how do they allow a certain function to take place? So I'm gonna go back to our questions. We already did this. We already started to identify, does the size of this insect matter? right? That's, that's a structure. The cluster together of the flower, does it being clustered together provide more food or something to land on? There's a reason for that structure and how it functions in the interaction with this insect. So it's white. That's another structural feature of this. And so we know that there are certain um, color preferences amongst um, insects and the, even down to the thin wings. That's another structural thing that we noticed and how not only did we notice it, excuse me, um, whoops, go back, go back, 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 sorry. Not only did we notice it, but we also considered if it would, how it would change. Like the question, instead of them being thin, how might the, the function of what they do change if they were heavy? And then what if, what do they, why do they have those veins in their wings? And what do those antenna do? So really a very basic, um, simple instructional practice that can be done anywhere at any time of notice and wonder. We're bringing to that concept um, and really just pausing for a minute to bring that lens of 
what structure and function relationships exist in what we're already doing. All right, so I'm gonna turn this over to Liz to help show us how this concept connects um, vertically. You're muted, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to look at how this particular recurring theme and concept uh, changes um, K through five and then beyond. Um, so in kindergarten, uh, students are identifying structures that animals have that allow them to interact with their environment and uh, specific interactions of seeing, hearing, moving, and grasping objects. In grade one, we're doing, uh, still doing plants and looking at how those structures help them live, move, and meet their basic needs. In grade two, we're looking at how structures help them find and take in food, water, and air. In grades three and four, we're looking at how external structures and functions enable them to survive in their environment. So you notice it's getting progressively more specific and more sophisticated. In grade four, we also incorporate plants. And then in grade five, we're looking at structures and functions of different species in the same environment. Okay, in middle school uh, through biology, a similar progression. Uh, in seventh grade, uh, one of the uh, student expectations is on organ systems and looking at the functions of the organ systems. In grade eight, uh, one of the student expectations that is connected to structure and function is looking at traits in a population and how the variations lead to adaptations and allow that organism to be successful. And then in biology, uh, we're looking at interactions among body systems uh, for regulation, nutrient absorption, reproduction, and defense. So, um... As in so many cases, reality is so much simpler than it really seems. You share phenomenon with children every time you take them outside. So all you have to do is make a point of noticing and wondering, and then using those recurring themes to think and talk more deeply about your observations. And also recognize that when you use strategies like notice and wonder in the informal outdoor setting, you're reinforcing connections with what the teachers are doing in school. I think you were gonna do that. So I was gonna take a moment now, uh, cause we've got some time. And I, and I thought if we, we went into breakout room. Now we need to sort of apply this to our own world. You've, you've thought about phenomenon, you've thought about the themes. Now I want you to think about your own programs and, and you know, the situations where you take kids out into nature. And so what I thought I would do is put us into breakout rooms for I don't know, maybe 10 minutes or so. And I was just gonna do it randomly because it's a lot quicker and sometimes you run into interesting people you wouldn't have ran into if you had selected. So this is my plan. I'm gonna create breakout rooms where we'll be in groups of three or four and you can talk to each other um, about, specifically I want you to talk about what you are already doing and ways that you might tweak what you're doing so that it really aligns closely to these things that the, the um, classroom teachers are um, going to be working on. Um, Carla and Liz, did I miss anything? 
Carla was saying something, but she was muted, but that's okay. All right. I said, no, I think that was great. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. A lot so, to add so, in. so I got five rooms and they're totally random. And I guess that's probably including us. Um, so there should be three or four of them in there. So go in and talk about um, what you are already doing with regards to sharing phenomena with children and how you might tweak it to make it a little bit more um, uh, rigorous on that. All right, I've opened the rooms. Great, and when we come back, Kiki, I'll share some resources that um, our viewers here can uh, take with them. So that'll mm -hmm. be great. Um, I'm Kim. I'm on my way. On my, I'm driving right now, but uh, but that's okay. We can we can chat. We can chat. Yeah, I saw your seatbelt, so um, that is a okay. Um, I had a um, field trip today, and we had a field trip and a nature story time yesterday. So um, you're sitting and driving. I'm just sitting like a lump right now because I'm just I'm just. It's it's the good kind of worn out, but I'm worn out. So, so anyway, <laughs> um, so where do you work? Where are you or volunteer work? Um, I'm a Texas Master Naturalist, and I'm also working for Forward ISD as an instructional coach for early learning. Um, okay. What district? Me, Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Okay, gotcha. Go ahead. Yeah. So to me, like we we focus a lot in like you know early childhood in having the kids discover, you know, okay. so the, I notice I wonder is like something that, that um, I've seen the teachers use a lot. Um, yeah. And it's also in our district, like we actually do have like two outdoor experiences, um, you know, so two, two times during the day where children go out um, one is on structure, which is basically like the recess, but the other outdoor experience is um, structured and it's actually like part of the curriculum and the activities that uh, the teachers um, perform with the kids um, yeah. have to do a lot with uh, with exploring, um, you know, nature. So um, a lot of things uh, that happen is like the kids take... Uh, things that they find out like you know in nature in their in their playground um and they bring them inside the classroom for observation and and uh and the the teachers push and we have like a interest areas right so it's basically what they would call centers like you know in, yeah. in kindergarten or in other districts and there's one that's dedicated especially to um discovery which is like you know just science in general yeah uh, so during that time like the teachers let the kids explore by themselves but they push into the interest area with like you know in this case discovery and they ask the kids like you know questions about like the their observations and it's basically like you know developing a lot of that oral language that that it's needed for for students so that's kind of like basically what uh what I what I've seen like you know related to to what um Kiki was saying and the other presenters yeah. as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I I think those what you just said those conversations are so critical not just for their understanding of the world but for their language development. Um, when I was back in the classroom, particularly when I was teaching um kindergarten in um a very like uh the placement of the school was a very urban environment and my kiddos didn't always have a lot of experiences they were always wanting to bring roly polies in i finally had to just set up a tank in my classroom that just had soil in it so we'd have somewhere for all the pocket roly polies to go and um and then we would just have so many good conversations because the children i taught a, a fair amount of them were English language learners, but they didn't have like, it wasn't because they were um, 
uh, primary Spanish learners or speakers at home, it was because they just had limited English proficiency because of their circumstances, parents working two, three jobs, and those conversations just didn't get to happen at home, not because anybody didn't want to, but just there wasn't energy and time. And so their language lagged. And so they needed those conversations. So it wasn't it wasn't important only for their discovery and um, developing their background knowledge for science. It was also just great for their language development. Um, so I, I hear you. I think that's wonderful that you guys do that. Now what I do, um, working at a site that is a nature preserve that serves school children primarily. Um, and we what's have- the, What's like, a nature preserve that you work for? Oh yeah. I work for the Nueces Delta Preserve, which is part of the Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries program. Um, but I had um, not a direct colleague of yours, but we have had a uh, Victor who's with Dallas ISD. And he, uh, I don't know that he's considered an instructional coach now. I'm not sure, but he, he was like a bilingual pre-K teacher. And now he is like serving as um, basically an instructional coach with um, Dallas ISD, but I don't know if he's assigned to certain schools or whatever to, to help uh, develop um, curriculum and uh, support the teachers in having uh, in having all the things they need um, ready for kids. And so um, he, um, oh, I wish I could think of Victor's last name. He's Puerto Rican. I, and he I has, know, do you know I was going to ask about? you, because I don't know if you would tell me like his last name, maybe I would be able to because actually know, I was I, working in Dallas before yeah. coming forward. Yeah. Yeah. I love Victor. So um he I can't think of it. It'll come to me later when we're not on this call, you know, when I'm like in my car. Yes. But um I could look it up. But um, but yeah, he's come down to workshops a couple of times, um, all the way down here in Corpus Christi, um, to to do like a pro growing up wild or things like that. And um, and uh I had an aquatic science. Uh, workshop this summer and Victor and his wife actually she I can't remember what district she works for another district in the area um I wish I could remember that but they're both Puerto Rican and um and just uh really lovely people um and uh and Victor's background I think is like his academic backgrounds in chemistry but he loves teaching early childhood um because you know the beauty of you know four-year-olds in particular is that gravity has not set in right like Five-year-olds, it's all rules, 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 but four-year-olds, anything is possible because the, you know, physics doesn't apply yet. And uh, yes. and so, um, I, you know, I, I love working with early childhood. I, you know, like yesterday I was working with high school kids uh, for the rest of the day after working with um, storytime kids, which is like two to five-year-olds um, in the morning. And then today was fourth graders. So we're serving all different age groups. I do think what they're talking about today fits with what we already do, which I figure you might say the same thing. It fits with what we already do. There's some things we could tweak in our curriculum. We write our own curriculum. Um, but uh, for all grade levels, we have a different uh, set of, of things to address. Um, and then, of course, do you know, you, yeah. Do you have trainings like spe uh, specifically for in like early childhood? you know, pre-KK or, yeah, you know, so I, I think that the ideal would be like pre-K because, you know, like pre-K yeah. has like the pre-K guidelines, which is basically yeah. the teaks for right. like, you know, K and on, but it is just like sometimes like difficult to find, um, you know, nature trainings that just apply to the early childhood. I agree. So I think that growing up wild has a lot of value. And then mm -hmm. and whenever I've used Growing Up Wild as an educator, I mean, I'm a trainer, but also when I've used it as an educator, I pick it, you know, I pick and choose what fits my time slot. I mean, there's so much there. You could pull it apart and like use, uh, use a lot of the stuff like across a week. And, you know, one thing I love to do with four-year-olds um, in particular is read a book more than once, read it several times during the week, you know, um, and then kids have a better chance to connect with that literature. They can connect for in multiple levels and layers. Project Learning Tree, which is the Texas Forest Service curriculum, has an early childhood one. I haven't used that one as much, but I, I am, you know, certified to train that one. One thing that I do, and I think it's so easy to find, um, 
I mean, you don't want to reinvent the wheel or anything, but um, I think you could easily come up with this. Always, 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 we connect these things to literature, right? I mean, when kids are when kids are in primary grades and even in upper elementary, you know, using mentor texts is so important. And then, um, and then I think, uh, you know, thematically in in pre K, you know, three through five year olds are you know, it's so important to connect things to story. So I think when you have that literature component and you're starting from there um, and then, you know, adding on activities to go with that, which is a lot of times how we plan for pre-K, I think that would work. I don't know um, if there's a, like, a, I would love to develop one, <laughs> but one that, uh, a curriculum for early childhood that really just starts with um, literacy you know, that starts with the literature, like the, the quality, high quality literature. Um, but the Growing Up Wild has a whole book list to go with what they do. And they have a little written piece in their curriculum um, that is focused on developing the teacher's background knowledge. Because, you know, when you teach like every content area, as you do with younger children, you have to be the expert on all the things. Right. Yes. And that's cool. So, um, so I think, um, I really appreciate that in growing up wild that they put that little piece in there for the teacher's background knowledge, you know, um, which you may be familiar with growing wild, like the, what Kiki yes. oversees the wild. I just took the training now. over, over the summer with Kiki. I went to, um, uh, for, no, what's Fort Parker state park. So that oh, okay. was, I've I never been there. It was okay. Late July. And okay. yeah, Kiki was the one that, you know, that presented the training and basically like uh i got certified you know but the only thing the only condition that that uh i still have to like fulfill is actually like you know presenting a training um in the area gotcha. so and i remember talking to kiki um from the growing up wild there's another or i guess like it's like a project that it's not finalized yet uh, okay. one of the master naturalist chapters developed yeah. like a starting up wild or there's something like that that it's like a, a starting up wild which is like you know for for ages yeah. like you know early childhood like pre-k3 pre-k4 yeah. so i know I that there's it's... like some resources yeah. there from uh, a texas there's master naturalist, naturalist chapter okay so i'm not familiar with that with the texas master i'm a master naturalist too down in my area um, but, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that one. I know that in San Antonio, I want to say it might be the San Antonio river authority. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but they have a curriculum that they use for early childhood and they have some neat, um, uh, neat activities that are already kind of structured in a lesson format. The, the thing about the growing up wild is, you know, all the resources are there and you make it fit your framework, you know, um, but, um, but anyway, I, I'm not saying that's the only thing out there, but, um, but I think, uh, I think there's a lot to work with in that, Yeah, you know, I do, I do. And then, you know, the funny thing in pre-K in early childhood, is we get so stuck on the holidays that we're focusing on, and, and that's not a bad thing, but we're focused, you know, there's cultural ties, which is great, but sometimes there are natural phenomena Often there are natural phenomena that go with those holidays that are kind of seasonal, you know? So I think, um, I think that uh, could be something to kind of just give some thought to, um, you know, like I, my theme for story time this time was beautiful butterflies because we're in migration season, you know, mm -hmm. but also butterflies are very costuming for what's coming up, you know, so we can tie it into that. Yeah. I think that it's like, oh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, opportunities for, for like, um, you know, getting like children uh, out in nature and, and, you know, keeping in mind, like in incorporating the literacy and also the math too, you yes. know. Yes. Um, Collecting data. Yeah. Yeah. Patterns like art and everything, you know. It's, yeah. it's really like, I really enjoy like, you know, working in early childhood for that purpose, you know? Yeah. 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 They are scientists. They are full on scientists. 
Oh, I'm muted. Um, I know who was in each room, and so we can we can call out the group numbers, and if you forget, we can call out names. Okay, that's good. And then each each room has an opportunity to speak, and if you want to pass, you can pass, but don't. Somebody must have said something brilliant. Okay, so room one was. Uh, Carla and Aaron and Kevin My and group. Alamo. All right. Who wants to talk? It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you talked, Kevin. You're in. Okay. So we, we just discussed that, uh, you know, I, I was a junior high teacher for a lot of years and, and, uh, I, I get really aggravated sometimes that, that, uh, we're expected to teach in this kind of sterile environment inside the classroom. And I feel like, you know, the early scholars had the outdoor classroom as their space to, to teach their students. And, and it's really important for us to get the kids out of the classroom as much as possible and get them out observing. We also talked about the fact that uh, it's really important for us to teach them how to problem solve, not to just lead them to the solution. And I, I think sometimes we're really quick to to say, OK, here here's the steps to get to the solution. But it's really better if we just allow them to problem solve on their own. That's it for me. Did you want to add anything, Alma? Not really. Not really. He did it on the spot. All right, now, well then. Alma was very informational in our session, so I can't, she has some really good things to say, so. <laughs> Is he putting me in a corner or what? <laughs> I felt like that was some arm twist in there. <laughs> well, just to let you know, we have a, a program for our for children. I'm a, uh, I'm secretary treasurer for our nonprofit, LMR c &D, mm -hmm. and we sponsor kids in, in the outdoors is what we do and work with school systems to get them out of the classroom. So we we have our Growing Rural program, which is a gardening program for kids where we uh, have the, the school kids come out to a community garden or we build our own school garden for them if they need it and have them actually experience a whole growing season. I'm talking all year of growing things in their gardens from flowers to, to vegetables to observations of pollinators, et cetera, et cetera. So when I saw that activity y'all gave with the word phenomena, I like that. And with the uh, relationships between structure and so on, that was absolutely perfect. That opened my eyes to how we can actually have them quantify what they're learning, okay? And that's all age groups because that particular growing rule program of ours is from age three all the way to third graders, which is 11 and 12 year olds. But then we also have a program called Youth for Earth, which individual children take on projects, youth take on projects that they feel are either environmental, agricultural, or community need projects and build the project themselves. By that time, they're a problem solver already. And nice. Too. Well, thank you. I'm glad your arm was twisted. <laughs> um, okay, so room two was Kate and Mark and Melissa and Michelle. Do y'all want? Do y'all have anything you want to share? Um, I will say that Melissa shared something pretty groundbreaking for me. Was just she didn't use, necessarily use the term marketing, but it's learning how to market our programs because, like we said, we're already doing a lot of stuff, but using the right terms. She said she saw like, what was it, Melissa, 70% increase in her participation once she started using some of those concepts and themes in her titles instead of our fun 50 titles that we want to use as informal educators. Something as simple as making that title change got a lot more participation. That was pretty huge for me. Cool. And Mark gave us some good terms that they had learned, unless he's going to speak up. I don't mean to speak for the whole group, but he said um, anchoring phenomena and supporting were some terms that they had used in some of their training cool yeah yeah i mean it's 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 important because they're looking for those specific things that they that they know will support them and all you have to do is 
like used the right word because you're talking about the same thing anyway. So awesome. I'm glad you had that discussion. Room three was Frankie and Kimberly and Lauren. Oh, except for Lauren, bless you. You had a hard time getting in. So it was just mostly Frankie and Kimberly. <laughs> so talk to us, you guys. What'd y'all come up with? Um, well, I don't know if uh, you want me to speak first or you want her to speak first. I just want to be a gentleman and, you know, allow her to speak first. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that we were talking about is like, for example, I, I work in early childhood, right? So um, we have pre K guidelines, which is basically the, the, the equivalent of the TEKS, right? So for us, is pre K three and pre K four, um, and one of the things that I've been wondering, and I think it, I've talked to you before, uh, Kiki, in finding those resources that that are aligned to the pre K guidelines, you know, and I know that, uh, you know, with the project uh, Wild, there is like activities that they can be performed, like you know, in um, early childhood as well, but um, that was one of the things that we we were talking about. Um, we also touched on, you know, for example, the early childhood program that we have here in Forward ISD uh, makes a lot of emphasis in an outdoor experience that is structured and it's planned with activities that um, teachers uh, perform with with uh, with students. So, um, also uh, that in uh, in our program the the, we're using the creative curriculum, which is um, a curriculum that has different interest areas. And one of the interest areas is the uh, discovery, which uh, is basically like science. And like, there's a lot of like uh, exploration and, and science like going on in, um, in the early childhood classroom. Uh, so that's basically one of the things that we, we touched on um, in our conversation. So I don't know if, uh, if you want to jump in or you want to say something else I, well i just i would just add on to that um our conversation was kind of led by the fact uh that um frankie is an instructional coach and then here at the noise itself to preserve one of the things we do is we um host professional development which i'm sure a lot of you uh do as well and so you know we focused obviously on on early childhood um but one of the things was um, that when we want to, when we want kids to focus on patterns, we want kids to focus on and draw conclusions about um, relationships and um, and phenomena and things like that. We um, sometimes, you know, they're making observations, and we want kids to draw evidence-based conclusions. But what can also help with that is like a literature connection, especially in early childhood, but that's not to say that it's uh, not appropriate with older kids too. In the last 24 hours, we have uh, served out here fourth graders today, high school juniors and seniors yesterday, and then early yesterday morning, we hosted our nature story time. So I've been working with kids of all different age groups and uh, just in the last 24 hours. And, you know, things obviously need to be developmentally appropriate. And uh, we emphasize evidence-based conclusions um, in all age levels, um, but we address whatever the seasonal phenomena are, or just the momentary phenomena are, uh, in a developmentally appropriate way. Nice. Yeah, y'all do such great work out there. Okay, quickly moving on. Room four, Heather and Yvette and Liz. And Kiki, I def definitely want to leave some room to share some of those resources before everybody gets right. off. Right, so like, do you guys have something brief to share heather yvette i'm sure it's great i want to hear hello i'm hearing silence which either means you're on mute oh <laughs> this event both mute and camera off <laughs> ah. but yeah no uh just to I, briefly talk a little bit about what we shared um um, Heather did home was do, is doing homeschooling, so she had her you know different you know ways ways of teaching that that are important. Um, and we we are with FNEP expanded food and nutrition education program, which is through extension. 
um, and we do um, nutrition education all over the place for adults and youth. But when we teach the youth, all of our um, programs are aligned with the teaks. And um, but it's just so interesting to to see the kids as they learn, you know, where um, maybe that you know tortilla chip came from, you know, from the ground all the way up to their table. They have no clue. <laughs> it's just interesting um, to 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 teach them, you know, not just about the nutritional value of, of the foods, but where it actually came from, and all those questions, all those probing questions to get them to start thinking and learning and and understanding, and just very very good for everyone you know nice fulfilling yeah great thanks yeah. Mm -hmm. we also and talked about how uh these recurring themes and concepts allow you to talk about a phenomena through all of the different disciplines math language arts science and social studies without having to silo the different subject areas Okay, and room five. I give me a brief synopsis. This would be Lindsay, Marcia, and Ola. Okay. Oh, here, I can talk a little bit about it. I think we were all playing the waiting game for who was oh. going to speak. <laughs> it's a good game. Um, it's a good yeah. game. <laughs> um, so we spoke a little bit about early childhood education specifically and taking kids out in nature. Um, we were, we had a conversation about how I know I'm a city employee and I rely a lot on like toys and the fun factor whenever I go out, but sometimes it's good to take a step back and let the kids just experience nature um, the way it's meant to be and not as much with like the fun things um, that we're so used to seeing and trying to entertain. And so instead, Marsha had some really great ideas about asking the students to build something out of what they can find in nature and like asking questions about why do you think that um, these items are the way they are? Like, what do they um what type of things do they provide in the setting uh, stuff like that, which I am not explaining what she was saying very well, but um, I took, I'm, I'm taking that back to what I do for my city um, as far as like, I don't have to put so much stress on the fun things and instead think of ways that we're interacting directly with nature while we're outside with the classes or with my um, groups that I work with. Nice. Thank you so much for sharing y'all. Okay, Carla, back at you. Oh, right. I love that. I love that last uh, bit. It really does speak to um, really sparking curiosity, right? That's, that's really what this is, is getting them to just pause for a minute and absorb that world around them. That's, that's what science is about. And then you were even kind of bringing in, which I mentioned in my group that our new standards, our new learning expectations have some engineering practices in them as well. So, um, you know, getting them to design new things based on a problem that they might be presented with out there is also part of this. So it's really awesome. Um, so we have, and this is something that we don't get to do very often. So I'm super excited. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, I've got two links for you here. I hope to drop them in the chat in just a minute. Um, one is a document that might help spark some of those questions when you're out in the field, you know, keep it on a clipboard or however you want to use it, but you're the first ones to see it. I'm super excited. Um, so this first one with the question stems on relationship between structure and function. So you might ask um, with the what we just saw, how does the flower, oh, sorry, something is up with my clicking. Super sorry. We're not sharing oh. anymore either. We're not? No, we came back from the breakout rooms and it dropped the share. Okay, well, thanks for that. Hold on a moment. I was like, wow, she's just riffing. It's great. She's just, you know, <laughs> that's good. I, I'm seeing it. <laughs> I'm not playing along with me. Um, all right, so. Basically, we have two documents for you. Um, one is something you could keep on your clipboard with these question stems. Um, let me get my, there we go. Um, so like with the 
uh, image that we saw earlier, um, how does the um, flowers, um, the the cluster arrangement allow the um, you know insect to get its food to land to whatever. So we've got some, you plug in whatever structure or organism or function into those questions and you've got a whole lot that can be um, processed. We can't um, see as, them very good because you don't have it in presenter mode. I don't. Or slideshow mode or whatever. I don't know. We're seeing the, wow, which if you zoom fun. in, that'll work, but. Um, well, it's, um, let me, it, in a minute, I, I mean, we can access them here and I'm going to put these in the chat. These um, are also, there's a page of several cards that it's just linking to those big concepts of what are our recurring themes and concepts. So if you're observing a phenomenon or experience, um, what themes and concepts might you notice? So let me um, drop this. This is, here we go. Is that helpful? Are we seeing this? Ah, nope. We've left. Have we left the uh, presentation. Yes. Okay. So, this is the first one: the relationship between structure and function. I'm going to just grab that right there, and drop it in the chat so that everybody can have it. And the other one, I'll go back. We have our next one is this it's just a, a, a you could put it inside your badge uh like like i do with some of my things um and keep it on hand um to just remember what those themes and concepts are and help call that to the front when um you're out and about so i drop that in the chat as well um and then um so Really, I mean, this is something that we would like to be able to do more of is provide um, resources like this. Um, I, I'd love to, if you can in the chat, how you, you know, type it in, how you might use one of these, or if you would want to see even more of these types of resources available. Um, these will be available for download on the website at some point, um, but you're getting a first peek and, and uh, it's only for you at this time. So congratulations. Um, early access. Early access, yes. Um, premier access. Um, but if you, you know, if, if in the chat you could tell us, um, it kind of helps drive our work um, here at TEA. Um, if these types of resources are um, useful to you or if you have an idea for a resource, we'd love to know. Um, how you could see yourself using these. Um, and um, let's see, that that really would be helpful. So if you don't mind. And then last but not least on our end for us uh, at TEA, we really do um, use feedback to uh, improve our processes. So um, this using this uh, survey link, um, if you snap it with your phone really quick, we really um, benefit from that feedback and, and, and really take it into account. How can we improve our processes? What do we want to stop doing, keep doing, improve upon? Um, so we really could use your um, feedback on that. And today uh, from TEA, you had myself, Carla Bailey, and Liz Baker, the wonderful, fabulous Liz Baker. Um, and uh, Kiki, do we have another survey that we need to provide? I uh, Aaron, Aaron has been linking the uh, Texas Children and Nature Network survey. And uh, right now we are seeing your laptop screen. There we go. There's the QR code and the, uh, the TEA survey. Uh, that really gives uh, us, uh, Carla and I, feedback on uh, how we did today, um, what you got out of it. Um, it gives you an opportunity to tell us um, what else you like to see, and uh, it feeds directly into our metrics. So it's part of our evaluation, and we'd really appreciate some feedback. Thank you. Awesome. So we are almost at, well, it's just turned three o'clock just now. And so I wanna thank everybody for their time and thank all of our presenters for their expertise and knowledge and 
and sharing this information in a fun and interactive way. We really appreciate it. I put a lot of pertinent information in the chat, lots of things about the summit, becoming a sponsor, registering. Um, October 15th is our last day for early bird registration for our summit, which is taking place in Houston, December 6th to the 8th. And we are still looking for summit sponsors. If you have any leads, contacts, just want to give us money, that's the link to give us money. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the recording. And then I will also be saving the, the chat and I will put these wonderful links in the follow-up email as well. So um, please feel free to reach out with any questions. I hope you saw the information about upcoming webinars. Our next one is October 18th on um, promoting outdoor time in schools through shacks. So check that one out. And we appreciate everyone participating in our exclusive partner webinar. We designed these specifically for our partners in mind. And thanks for everyone's um, participation and y'all have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye, thanks. Cool. Thanks Erin for helping out. Thanks all the presenters. Thank you. Many of you all. Have a great Wednesday. Yeah, you too. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much for everything. It'll be a short one, so we're good. Yeah, absolutely. Good yeah. job, y'all. Thank you.